Hi friends and welcome to Friendly Pharmacy 5. This is going to be a new part of the channel where I go over relevant information and research that I thought would be important to share. These videos will likely go over the five minute mark. So I just wanted to let you know that right up front. Today I will be discussing a new study that was recently released that spoke about the use of some acid reducers and COVID-19. Okay, so I wanted to go over some just general points about the digestive system before we actually go into the study. So the digestive system, as we know, is a very long tube. So it starts at the mouth when we eat our food, goes down to the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, large intestine, the colon, and then it terminates at the anus. So that's just a general anatomy for you. Now, what does the stomach do? Why is it important? So the role of the stomach, obviously it receives food and it actually does expand when it does receive food as well. It breaks down our food, so it really churns the food. And also there are enzymes and different gastric, gastric juices that are there uh, when the food arrives and that helps to break down the food even further. Very little food or nutrients are absorbed from the stomach. Most of it, most of the absorption happens in the small intestine. So for the most part, the stomach is preparing the food, breaking it down for uh, transport and, and actually pushing it into the small intestine, which is where the majority of absorption of food, medications, vitamins, nutrients, and that kind of thing occurs. Whenever we use the word gastric, we are referring to stomach, okay? And uh, in the stomach, there is a very important mucosal lining, and that helps to protect the stomach from stomach acid and different digestive juices. If this mucosal lining is broken, we start to develop what could be a peptic ulcer, there starts to be pain in the stomach, that kind of thing. So the mucosal lining is very important, and it is very protective. Uh, for the stomach and it allows the stomach to do its job without causing the individual any kind of pain or discomfort. So we know that the stomach is a very acidic environment and that has a couple of purposes. So first of all, of course, the acidic environment helps to break down the food that we're eating. It also acts as a bit of a barrier to any kind of foreign substance that would enter the body, say through food or through uh, maybe putting your hands in your mouth or something like that. If a bacteria or virus or some kind of what we call pathogen tries to enter the body that way, then the acidity of the stomach does work as somewhat of a protective barrier in that it can, it can stop these organisms from being uh, passed on into different parts of the body and uh, essentially it can render them inactive or even kill them in this environment. So the acidity of the stomach is quite important. Usually the pH of the stomach is around 1.5 to 3.5. So that is very, very acidic. And the kind of acid that I'm speaking about that is produced in the stomach by the, the cells, the parietal cells that I have here is called hydrochloric acid. Okay, so acid reducers. So sometimes we have too much acid being produced or sometimes that mucosal lining that I spoke of has been somehow uh, affected and we need to somehow cause less acid to be produced by the stomach. There are a few different reasons why this can happen. There are also other disease states such as inflammation of the esophagus or issues with the sphincter that's in between the stomach and the esophagus that can cause problems. The acid can rise into the esophagus and that kind of thing. So there are quite a few different indications for why we would recommend uh, an acid reducer. Acid reducers are different than say uh, an acid neutralizer. So sometimes uh, in Canada, we have like Tums or Rolaids, things like that, that neutralize the acid. That's not what I'm speaking of here. Here I am speaking of medications that actually affect the cells that are in the digestive tract and cause them to reduce the amount of acid that they're throwing into the stomach when these cells are stimulated by eating, seeing, or smelling food, okay? So there's, H2 antagonists, which are actually 
histamine antagonists, not to be confused with allergy medications, which are also antihistamines. This is a different receptor and it is a different mode of action. And then we have proton pump inhibitors. And the proton pump inhibitors are what I'm going to be speaking to today. The proton pump inhibitors are much more effective than the histamine antagonists, okay? So, and they're very widely prescribed and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. So the H2 antagonists, you may have heard of them uh, as being brands like Zantac or Pepsid. Uh, they're often available without a prescription and the generic names are listed there. Uh, proton pump inhibitors are usually prescription. I've listed a few of the brand names that I'm aware of there. And then the generic names, because a lot of these medications are now available as a generic, um, are listed there for you. So um, you can see that they all end in Zol, um, which is interesting, but there are antifungals that end in Zol as well. So be careful, don't make that generalization there. Okay, so these are a couple of the options that we have um, for medication to help reduce the amount of acid that the stomach is producing. The proton pump inhibitors are very effective. They work extremely well. They essentially, they shut down stomach acid for a period of maybe eight to 24 hours, depending on the dose, depending on the formulation of the medication. And they work very, very well. If you have ever had a stomach ulcer, if you have ever um, had any kind of bleed in your stomach and you've needed one of these, you will be able to tell me how effective they are and how thankful you are or were that you found these, okay? Again, you would never take something like this without a prescription from your doctor or consult consultation with your pharmacist, okay? So these are the proton pump inhibitors that I had listed. You may recognize some of those. Uh, they're very commonly prescribed. And these are some of the main indications. So a good reason for you to be prescribed one of these would be something like an esophagitis. So when we say itis, that's inflammation. So inflammation of the esophagus, uh, documented history of a bleeding ulcer, chronic NSAID use. So NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are anti-inflammatories. They're often available over the counter, but some are prescription. You may know them, know them more commonly as, say, ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac, uh, Volterin is one of the brand names. Those are all classified as NSAIDs. Grade C or D esophagitis, so a more severe esophagitis or severe gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, and that would be something that when we say something is severe in this case, it is something that is interfering with your day to day activities. It is causing you enough pain or enough discomfort that it's really interfering with your ability to live your day to day life. So these are appropriate indications for long term use of proton pump inhibitors, which is the class of medications that I'm discussing. So we know that all medications do have side effects. And so here are some of the possible side effects of proton pump inhibitors. And I'm specifically here talking about long-term use. And long-term use in this case would be classified as more than eight weeks, uh, sometimes even more than 12 weeks. There are a few indications for proton pump inhibitors when you would need to use them for longer than that, but there are some. So these are the main ones, the main side effects uh, of long-term use, low magnesium, vitamin B12 deficiency, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, bone fractures, intestinal infection, chronic kidney disease, pneumonia, and cancer was even listed, but I don't know the specifics on that. Uh, it has to do with cancer of the uh, digestive tract, polyps, that kind of thing, and that is not something that I'm going into in this video. Okay, so at this point, we have covered what a proton pump inhibitor is, what it does. Remember, it stops those cells from throwing acid into the stomach environment. It's about nine, they're about 90% effective, okay? And they're able to leave the pH of the stomach at about a pH of about six. So stomach acid usually being about 1.5 to three, remember we discussed that? So being at about six is quite high, so it's really causing the stomach to be much more what we would call basic or neutral, okay? 
So we know all of that. We know the proper indications for prescribing and some of the more common side effects. In no way during this video am I recommending that you stop taking your proton pump inhibitor. I am recommending that you speak with your pharmacist or your physician about whether this is the most appropriate therapy for you, especially if you have been on these medications for more than eight weeks or so. We know that proton pump inhibitors are widely prescribed throughout the world, and rightly so in some cases, because they do work very, very well. However, we also know that they are often overprescribed, and this is something that I am bringing your attention to. There was a Cochrane review that's right here uh, that stated that approximately 25 to 70 percent, so that's quite a big range of people, are prescribed a PPI inappropriately. So with the wrong indication, maybe for the wrong length of time, uh, maybe without the proper follow-up or the proper diagnosis. Okay, so that's what I'm covering in this video. Okay, so having gone through all of this information, I would just recommend that if you are unsure whether a proton pump inhibitor is the right therapy for you, or maybe it's been a while since you've had a follow-up from your physician or spoken with your pharmacist, maybe now would be a good time to start that conversation. Ask about whether this is the best option for you and whether the duration of treatment is appropriate. Thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Bye-bye.